Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our next training in our trauma series. Today, we're going to be talking about abdominal and pelvic trauma and how to manage and recognize these injuries. The majority of abdominal trauma that we're going to see in the field is going to be blunt trauma. And this actually serious abdominal trauma accounts for close to one fifth of trauma deaths in the country. And this is usually due to serious major organ injury and massive hemorrhage. If you remember, there's five places to bleed to death. We have the street, which is extremity hemorrhages, which we have the ability to control with tourniquets. There's the femur, which we can recognize and try to splint or use a tourniquet if necessary. We can stabilize the pelvis with a pelvis binder. But some of our trickiest hemorrhages that we just need to recognize are in the abdomen and the chest. There's not a lot we can do about this in the field other than have a high degree of suspicion when these injuries occur and realize that we need to get them to the hospital as quickly as we can because the only people that can help are located in the hospital. Just like everything, we always start with anatomy. If you look at the anatomical layout of the stomach, you have your solid organs, which are your liver and your spleen, located in the upper part of the abdomen. And the majority of the rest of the abdomen is the intestines and the bowels. The abdomen can be divided into four quadrants. So when you're talking about the right upper quadrant, the majority of your solid organs up here are going to be your liver, your gallbladder. There's part of the pancreas over here, more towards the midline. In the left upper quadrant, you have your spleen and your stomach, along with your major vessels that transverse the entire abdomen and down into the pelvis. And mostly in your lower quadrants, you're going to have intestines. On the right side is your appendix. And in the pelvis is the bladder, all the genitourinary organs, and the great vessels. Importantly, in the abdomen, it's also kind of divided into anterior and posterior compartments as well. So in the, in the front of the abdomen, in the anterior part, is where the intestines kind of overlie a lot of the more important organs that are closer to the back and more protected. So you have your kidneys, your great vessels, your pancreas, and part of your large intestine are all located in the retroperitoneal or kind of deeper part of the abdomen. Now it's important when you're talking about anatomy because this can tell you what kind of injury patterns to suspect. So if you have a patient who had a blow, say, to the left lower ribs and the left side with rib pain, it's really important to remember that right underneath those 10th, 11th, and 12th ribs is where the spleen is. And so just like a broken rib can puncture the lung, a broken rib can also puncture the spleen and cause a massive intra-abdominal hemorrhage. Same thing on the right. If you have right-sided lower rib injury or penetrating or blunt, remember that those two major organs are located under the ribs, and on the right side you can have a liver injury as well. Any upper abdominal injury, in addition to injuring the abdominal organs, the liver, the stomach, the pancreas, the spleen, it's important to realize that the heart is right there as well. So kind of that middle area in the lower ribs, it can be chest or it can be abdominal. Just remember to consider both types of injuries. And then if you move a little bit lower with pelvic injuries, when we're talking about pelvic fractures, which we'll go into in depth a little bit later, realize that there's a lot of important underlying anatomy there as well that is prone to injury, especially the bladder and the genitourinary tract. Really a good safe rule of thumb when you're considering any type of abdominal injury is if the wound is below the nipple line on a male, those lungs are probably decompressed and it's safe to assume if you have a wound below the nipple line that there's also some abdominal compartment involvement. So remember there's two kinds of trauma, there's blunt and there's penetrating. So penetrating trauma is kind of easy when we're thinking about the abdomen. If there's a penetrating injury, just get them to the hospital. There's a very high likelihood of underlying serious organ injury that can cause either hemorrhagic shock or septic shock and lead to death pretty quickly. There's not a lot we can do about that other than get them to a surgeon. Now the other type of injury patterns to the abdomen might be a little more difficult to recognize, and so it's on us to have a high degree of suspicion whenever there's blunt trauma to the abdomen. 
and patients aren't always going to be super clear that they do have a serious underlying injury. So we need to recognize serious mechanisms and be ready to act. When we're talking about blunt trauma, we just covered all the solid organs and the hollow organs in the abdomen. It's important to realize that solid organs, because they're engorged with blood, tend to rupture and they can bleed a lot. Um, if you think about it, our entire body's five liters of blood is cycling through each organ about every minute. So five liters a minute is going through the kidneys, the liver, the spleen, the heart, and the lungs. And if that organ, which is incredibly vascular, is disrupted in any way, it's, it can bleed heavily very quickly as opposed to hollow organs, which, if you think about it, that's mainly the GI tract, so the stomach, the intestines, the large and small intestines, or the bladder, and those tend to rupture just like a balloon would. And that kind of injury doesn't necessarily lead to hemorrhagic shock, but it can lead to a lot of complications later. Here's another look at an uh, anatomical picture of some blunt trauma to the abdomen. So if you take a cross section, pretend you're standing at the patient's feet, and um, you're looking at them crosswise, you can see the liver here in the right upper quadrant. Right behind the liver and the spleen are the two kidneys very close to the backbone. You have your major vessels here, your aorta and your inferior vena cava. You've got your stomach, which inevitably is full of food and gastric contents when someone has a bad trauma. And then you have your spleen over here on the left, just underneath those ribs. And if you have a patient who's experienced blunt trauma, when we take them to the CAT scan, this is what a liver or splenic injury would look like. You, just like we see in the diagram there, you have the liver here on the right, and here is a stomach. So on CAT scans, the uh, fl any kind of fluid will be a darker shade of gray, so almost black. So you see the stomach here full of stomach fluid. But what you also see over here near the liver is that the liver, just like we talked about, the very vascular organ tends to be crushed and kind of almost crack. And you can see the blood pooling in here where the liver has been lacerated and blood's pooling around and below it. And same thing over here. This is a very serious, probably grade four liver laceration right through the hilum of the liver. The liver has basically been dissected in half by probably an anterior posterior trauma. And you can imagine what happened if this person got crushed from the front to the back. This is a backbone right here. And so anytime there's a crushing injury from the front to the back, the backbone serves as kind of a nidus to, to break these solid organs, essentially. So you can see your pancreas right here was probably injured as well. Over here is the spleen, and then this is the stomach with some some stomach contents in it and you have your two kidneys here which look like they're relatively uninjured but it's important to consider that mechanism with the with the backbone as a nidus to to cause injury to the overlying organs now when we're considering mechanisms for injury the most common cause of severe injury usually involves motor vehicle crashes and you can see part of why that is here here's a restrained dummy who's in a in a crash test and here's a picture of what's happening is that compressive force from the rapid deceleration injury can compress, compress those organs just like we talked about it against the backbone. So those hollow organs act just like a balloon and they can burst and the solid organs are solid and they can crack or rupture. So any kind of compressing or shearing or acceleration deceleration forces can be very severe on abdominal organs. Falling is another common mechanism of severe abdominal injury and just like any fall the severity of the injury is going to depend on the distance what kind of landing surface there is and how the patient impacts the ground usually this type of injury pattern will have hollow viscous or retroperitoneal injury I think the most important point to make here about patients that have fallen from a significant height is they're likely going to have very distracting orthopedic injuries and they can be pretty ugly and take a lot of your attention, but it's important to realize that just as much force that went into breaking those bones probably went into those hollow viscous and abdominal and chest organs as well. So don't forget possible underlying injuries, that even if they're not as visible as the broken bones. Evisceration is another type of common abdominal injury. 
I know you all have likely seen this before. Just important learning points here are don't try to replace any contents that are outside of the body or not located where they should be. The best thing you can do is just try to stabilize them, keep them moist. You don't want to soak them with normal saline, but a moist dressing so it doesn't get sticky or rip any more tissue than needs to be damaged. Cover with a moist sterile dressing if you can keep them stabilized and most importantly especially with abdominal injuries is trying to keep the patient calm and treating their pain so that they're not increasing any more of that abdominal pressure making the evisceration any worse. Pediatric abdominal trauma is a special population and very important to consider. They're incredibly susceptible to abdominal injury simply because they don't have usually as much overlying fat as adults do and so their organs are a little more vulnerable than adults. They also have very compliant bones and their organs are a little bit larger in terms of surface to area ratios and so that leaves them very prone to serious organ injury inside the abdomen. Some of the most common injury patterns again would be motor vehicles but I've also seen a lot of bicycle injuries from handlebars or falling for instance like on a wall or something like that where there's a significant trauma right across the abdomen, usually just near the umbilicus. And as we mentioned before, the reason this is such a big deal in children is because they do have such little abdominal fat and their organs are relatively large. They get that compressive force against their backbone. And here you see a badly injured pancreas where there was an anterior posterior compressive force that just cracked that pancreas right across the backbone and caused a pretty severe abdominal injury. It's important to note in pediatrics that they can lose almost half of their blood volume and only be tachycardic. So have a high degree of suspicion based on the pain level, the bruising patterns, the mechanism of injury, and don't just wait for the blood pressure to be low to realize that you have a sick patient. If you have a tachycardic child, take that very seriously and get them to the hospital as soon as you can. Another special population we need to talk about is pregnant patients. Abdominal trauma in a late-term pregnancy can be a life-threatening injury to both the mother and the baby. And it doesn't necessarily need to be a very significant trauma to cause placental abruption. And that's where the placenta tends to rip away from the wall of the uterus. And a whole lot of blood can pool there in that potential space to the point where the mom goes into hemorrhagic shock. And these symptoms usually cause pain and lightheadedness and dizziness to the mother. You'll see the normal things you would for hemorrhagic shock, abdominal pain, tachycardia, maybe hypotension. Realize that it doesn't take a lot to cause this, and the symptoms can be delayed up to 48 hours. But it can be incredibly detrimental to the to the baby. So have a high degree of suspicion for severe abdominal trauma or injuries in any pregnant patient. If you do find yourself transporting a late-term pregnant patient, remember that you want to tilt her to the left for transport. Use whatever you need to, whether it's blankets or rolling the backboard or propping her up just to get the pressure off of that inferior vena cava because the, the fetus can compress the blood flow return to the heart and the lungs against the spine. And you want to move, move that extra weight off to the side so you can facilitate blood flow a little bit better. Now, clues that you're looking for with serious abdominal injury, really your best hint that there's a serious injury will be the patient's pain. Their abdomen will be either very distended or incredibly tender. They'll be guarding. And then you look for bruising patterns as well. Now, if you have a patient with other distracting injuries, maybe femur fracture or arm fracture or even a head injury, they might not be as focused on your abdomen as you need to be. So make sure you're doing a good secondary assessment and considering abdominal trauma based on the mechanism. Retroperitoneal injury, these are the organs that we mentioned early on that are kind of located deeper in the abdomen, the kidneys, the pancreas, uh, bigger parts of the large intestine. Really, the most common injuries here are going to be pancreatic, duodenal, and kidney injuries. And this is most commonly seen in children because, again, they don't have as much overlying fat. Things that you look for, these tend to be late signs, but they do mention them in some of the the textbooks would be colon sign is bruising around the umbilicus. You might see that can indicate a retroperitoneal injury. And then Gray-Turner sign is bruising along the flanks. 
And again, usually these are from, from crush type of injuries or rapid deceleration. Another thing you can look for, if you see it, you could recognize it as there's been documented cases of Kerr's sign, which is when the spleen is injured, the innervation of the spleen actually comes from way up high in the cervical vertebrae. And sometimes splenic injury can be referring pain to the left shoulder. If you have a patient that's complaining of left shoulder pain who had a serious mechanism for abdominal injury, consider possible splenic injury. Moving on from the abdominal compartment to the pelvic compartment, there's three different types of pelvic fractures. You don't need to have these memorized, but it's important to understand that depending on the way the pelvis fractures might depend on how well you can manage the bleeding and the underlying injury. So vertical shear is the first type of injury, and the way I picture this is kind of a patient who's sitting in a car. They have a a head-on collision, and their knee hits the dashboard and slams their hip back into their pelvis, and it just shears part of the pelvis up towards their head, and the other part of the pelvis stays in place. An anterior posterior compression injury is just like it sounds. There's, There's some crushing injury from the front to the back, and the pelvis tends to open just like a book, which is where open book pelvis gets its name, but it cracks the pubic symphysis right here. This this is essentially a ring, and the ring bursts, and the weakest part of the ring is right there at the cartilaginous structure in the pubic symphysis. Because it's a ring, it usually breaks in two places, and the other place it tends to break is right along the sacroiliac joint back here. And then patients can also undergo lateral compression, which is basically just a blow from a side. So this would be like a a T-bone kind of injury where the pelvis folds in on itself. And one part of the the hip and the femur down here and the pelvis breaks the ischial tuberosities here and the sacroiliac joint to where it folds inside. Important to note is that All of this, this is a spine right here, and all of these little sacral foramina are where a bunch of nerves come out, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But the three different types of pelvic fractures, the one that we're going to be best able to manage is going to be the anterior-posterior compression because we can just close that book right back. If you look at that in an x-ray, this will be exactly what we just looked at, but this is normal. So you have a nice big pelvic ring right here. Everything's closed. you got these little little rings here, uh, femoral heads are right where they should be. And if you look at this patient who's undergone a severe trauma here, this is what an open book pelvic fracture looks like. So this would be a patient who underwent some sort of anterior, posterior, massive compression. So you can see that that pubic symphysis here is just splayed open. And not only that, but the ring broke. And so the sacroiliac joint is also dislocated up here. And you also have a femoral neck fracture over here. So this pelvis underwent some very significant trauma, and I would venture to say this patient is probably pretty unstable. The reason the patient would be unstable is when you consider, it's one thing to look at x-rays when you're just looking at the bones, but when you consider all the vasculature that's running through that pelvis, it's easy to see why people can bleed to death with pelvic injuries. You've got the the distal part of the aorta here bifurcates into the iliac arteries and eventually the femoral arteries. And any fracture here, remember those fracture fragments are just like little knives. And depending where the fracture is can cause pretty severe vascular injury. And especially to those really thin walled veins that line the pelvis down here. So a lot of venous bleeding tends to happen in bad pelvic fractures good news is we can venous bleeding as you know is usually pretty easy to stop it just takes a little bit of pressure so since we can't get inside the pelvis and supply pressure to stop bleeding the best thing we can do is put a pelvic binder in place important to note that when you do put the pelvic binder on you want to have it located not as high as you think so you have your your iliac spines up here that you can actually feel go a little bit lower right over your femoral condyles And by pulling those together, you're essentially going to close the book where that pubic symphysis has opened. So if you think about it where the pubic symphysis is located, you want to go lateral to that and use the majority of your binder to close that book back and stop that bleeding. Now, I know we have the very fancy pelvic binders that can be a little bit complicated to tie, but realize all you need is something with a 
a fair amount of width to it, but a sheet would do just fine as long as you can bind it tightly and get those femoral condyles back together. I mentioned earlier about all of the nerves that are coming out of that sacral plexus as well, but if you look at this, if you were already talked about all the fractures that can happen and all the vascular supply, but there's also a ton of nerves that go to the pelvis. So it's really important if you've got a patient that's pretty sick with a severe mechanism, you want to do a fairly good neuro exam. And the quickest way to do that is just ask them initially if they can wiggle their toes because you know if they can get to the point where distally they can wiggle their toes, likely they're still neurologically intact. But it's important to try to get a good neurovascular exam as well. An important thing with pelvic trauma would be genitourinary trauma. So the bladder as a hollow organ can be prone to rupture. And in males, just because they have a longer urethra, they tend to be prone to have more urethral injuries. And this is incredibly important in motorcycle wrecks. Those motorcycle injuries tend to cause straddle injuries. And what that means is that the pelvis where the patient is centered tends to be have an anterior compression force against the, against the motor and the gas tank, and it tends to cause really bad pelvic fractures in motorcycle injuries. And so here you see a fracture pattern around the pubic symphysis and it can manifest as either a scrotal hematoma or blood at the urethral meatus. Or here, this is actually a open fracture where the bone fragment from the pelvis, which is fractured, has, has cut through the skin and actually caused an open fracture. And realize that those fragments can lacerate major arteries. And so these are, these are incredibly important and incredibly bad injuries that can have a significant mortality. So vital signs are vital, and uh, it's important to recognize shock early and act on it early. So my favorite way to be suspicious of shock is just to check a radial pulse. If they're fast, around 120 to 140, and the patient is anxious and confused, in my mind, that patient is in class 3 shock until they prove otherwise. And it's really easy to just touch them and check a radial pulse. Is it there? Is it not? If it's not there, they're probably very, very sick. And if it is and it's fast and it's thready with the right mechanism, I have a high degree of suspicion and move a little bit faster. Now, when we're talking about abdominal pain and abdominal injuries, your biggest clue to a severe injury is going to be the patient's pain. You need to be extra cautious in elderly patients who might be anticoagulated and then in any type of pelvic injury as well. So make sure you're exposing your patient, getting a good history if you can, and figuring out what their risk factors are for severe injuries. Treatment is gonna be the same as any trauma. You're gonna do your ABCs first. You're quickly gonna decide based on mechanism and how they look and their vital signs, whether you need to transport quickly. Again, have that high degree of suspicion for abdominal injury, and you can do most of your interventions en route. So like we mentioned before, with our five places to bleed to death, there's not a lot to do for bad abdominal trauma other than get them to the hospital. The things that you can do to help are preventing hypoxia, keeping them warm because we want to prevent that triangle of death, and then getting IV access and trying to maintain permissive hypotension with a goal systolic blood pressure of 90. Consider a pelvic binder if you have the right mechanism and concerning exam, and make sure you're monitoring vitals en route. Really, if you see life-threatening injuries, abdominal trauma is fairly straightforward. What you can do is you can control the bleeding that you can see, and you can do your best to prevent hypoxia and hypothermia. We know the five places to bleed to death, the street, the femur, the pelvis, and then the chest and the abdomen. So if we're looking a little bit about what's coming and what's happening in the hospital, some of the latest and greatest talk in the literature is that warm, fresh, whole blood has been proven to be better than parts of blood that's given in the hospital. Uh, this, most of these studies are coming from the military, but it probably won't be long till it finds its way into the hospital. And it's a, it's a neat thing because the warm, fresh, whole blood actually has a longer shelf life and has seeming to do better for mortality for patients in hemorrhagic shock than just giving red blood cells and platelets separately. And one more thing that's coming out of the hospital is a procedure called Reboa, which is actually a catheter that the surgeons put in through the femoral artery up into the aorta for abdominal injuries that are causing bleeding, and they can insert the balloon as high as they need to to cut off where 
the bleeding is happening until they can get the patient to the operating room. And it essentially shunts blood up to the heart and the lungs and the brain to plug the hole that's lower in the abdomen. So it's kind of kind of exciting, and uh, it probably won't be long till it finds its way into the hospital. And that's all I have about abdominal trauma. So if you have any questions, let me know, or um, I'm sure the 7-8s will be happy to talk about it as well.